I would like to open this session. Uh, this session is uh, the talking about the survey to measure uh, catastrophic cost due to TB among the TB patients and families, which is quite a very critical measurement, uh, measuring the progress against the NTB strategy target, as probably all you know. So I think the significance of this work uh, have been done in the past uh, couple of years, or maybe two years, is uh, really uh, important uh, when we are thinking, of, thinking ahead for how to uh, accelerate NTB strategy implementation in countries. Uh, so I think with this significance of the, this importance of this uh, work, uh, I'd like to really happy to have this session, and then I'm very honored to be uh, chairing this session. I'm Nobu Nishikiori, uh, w working in the Global TV program. I just joined from the uh, regional office for Western Pacific. Uh, together with me, the uh, chair, uh, the vice chair is My name is Andrew Soroka. I also work in the WHO Global TB program as a health economist. And a big part of my job is helping oversee these patient cost surveys. And the first survey, the first presentation we'll have will be from Dr. Tom Wingfield, who's been a big part in helping develop the methodology and carrying out these surveys. Uh, he's an infectious disease doctor and lecturer at the University of Liverpool. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm just going to give today really a, a bit of an overview about the development of the cost tool over the past one to two decades. Um, first of all, look on the economic impact of illness and specifically TB, measurement um, of costs and how we approach that, different definitions that we've had over the years of catastrophic costs. And then talk about some selected research. Obviously, there's lots of research I can't mention leading to the WHO survey. And then a bit about the survey approach and considerations, but Innes is going to talk more about how that's actually been rolled out and the future directions. So in terms of the economic impact of illness, we've, we've known for a long time that there's households have catastrophic healthcare expenditure and that a lot of the issues around that and people who, who have these catastrophic costs are houses like on the bottom line there that are the living below the poverty line and those who have high out-of-pocket payments for their total health expenditure. This is just another figure from this paper from Sue et al, which shows on the bottom, you can't see it very well, but out-of-pocket payment and total health expenditure as a proportion and then the proportion of households who actually have um, uh, high out-of-pocket payments. So these things are very much positively associated. Uh, but what about TB? We know that prior to being diagnosed with TB, just having the illness, you go to try and seek care. And when you try and seek care, uh, and when you engage with the system, you're going to incur costs, be they indirect costs, which is the time of being off work, be that you as the patient or a carer or guardian, or direct costs which are related to, say, fee medical fees um, or things like travel uh, and additional food within the house that is required. And all of these things can mean that you have to change what you do within your household, the finances, the way you use them. Uh, for example, labour substitution, the, the way that you set up who's working within the household. But also these kind of dissaving measures, so using your savings, selling some of your assets, be it a sofa in, in your house or be it something else, a cooker, what have you, and then borrowing. There's other strategies that people use as well. For example, in Peru, it's quite common to have what's called a pollada, where you make a kind of chicken stew and you sell it to people in your locality to try and make additional money to pay for your, your treatment. And we also know about the medical poverty trap, and this is work that we did from Peru and people's costs um, out of pocket on this side, from least poor to poor to poorest TB affected households. And you'll see that the poorest households are actually spending less than the least poor households on TB uh, and accessing TB care. But what that means to that household as a proportion of their annual income 
actually increases as you get to the poorest households. So up from a quarter here in this case to the poorest household who are incurring 50% of their uh, annual income. So the poorest people are, are, are really having the, um, the, it, the biggest impact in terms of costs. And there's lots of different ways to measure costs. And I, I, I'm not a health economist, um, but just looking up at a few of them. So human capital, so you estimate your future loss of productivity. So, for example, work days lost, and, and we can do that. It's quite easy to do, but wages are notoriously inaccurate, especially if you're within a culture that doesn't have much of a formal workplace. Uh, and it can misestimate the burden um, of costs. And then there's things like willingness to pay, which actually ask the households, well, what do you value? What, what will you value? How much would you be willing to pay for your um, health to return to normal? Which is a bit more a holistic approach. But again, it's a subjective thing. So, so you're trying to take into account the household's opinions, but actually the, the values you get from that are, are not very objective. Then you've got things like loss of output. For example, if you keep crops, well, what are you producing in terms of, say, here in Mexico, your corn production? And the good thing about that is that you might be able to capture not just during illness, but following illness, um, about how much production you, you have. But this will miss your out-of-pocket payments. And then finally, things like friction costs, where you look at the time to return to your pre-morbid uh, um, pre-illness productivity, which, de which captures indirect costs, but it's generally not at a household level. So th there's lots of different ways to measure costs. And there's been various definitions of what constitutes a catastrophic cost, and really catastrophic um, meant in, in, in some of the earlier works, pushing people below the poverty line or further into poverty. And there were various definitions from 5% of your annual income to 20%. Then it stuck for a while, actually, at 10% of an annual household income, of a household's annual income, and then 40% of a household's capacity to pay. And by that, I mean really the money that's left after you meet your subsistence needs, so, so your food, for example. And then work that I'll mention briefly from Peru, we, we tried to correlate these um, thresholds of costs uh, by your annual income with adverse TB treatment outcomes. And we found that costs of over 20% of your annual household income were associated with death on treatment, tr TB treatment failure, abandonment of treatment. So there are various ways in which, or classifications, definitions for catastrophic costs. So what about the research that's been done? As I said, th th there is a lot of great research that's been done, but I, I, can't, I can't cover it all, unfortunately. But I'd be happy to talk about it to anybody who's interested afterwards. So obviously there are many studies done, say, in the 90s and, and 2000s, and this one done, done by Bertie Squire and team was looking at the costs in Malawi. And the interesting thing here, amongst many other things, is so if you look at the total cost as a percentage of monthly income, so coming up for one and a half months' income. But really, the thing that's important here as well is what, what about if you take a, a food away from this? So what does this mean that you've got left after food expenditure? And so you can see that obviously food expenditure has a big impact on what your costs are going to be and how that's going to affect your household. And some of the work that was done prior to this then led to this USAID uh, TB cost tool, which was developed with KNCV um, towards 2008. And that pulled together lots of different elements of the other research that had been done. So it looked at poverty indicators. It looked at the direct costs that I mentioned before, so medical costs or non-medical costs, such as food and travel. It also looked at hospitalization costs indirect costs such as lost income, but carer and guardian costs, again, not just the patient, but how does this affect the household? And within it incorporated coping strategies. So again, I'm talking about selling assets, using savings, having to take out a loan. And to some extent, it incorporated productivity. So it tried to have everything in one um, tool. And Verena Mouch, who, who developed uh, the tool uh, along with lots of other people, uh, piloted that out in Kenya in, in two districts. Uh, and you can see here that it, we've got direct costs here, indirect costs, and total costs as a percentage of the household's monthly income. And so this is up to seven months of uh, the household's income. 
The issues that they said that they had with this were in more rural areas where um, actually they it was difficult to put a monetary value on income, uh, where people, for example, were more agrarian uh, in what they did. They also found that there were gender issues with trying to implement this questionnaire. For example, uh, a female of the household not... Um, not claiming her own wages or her own income and everything went through the mail of the household. And sometimes that was quite tricky and a sensitive issue to deal with in the questionnaire. And pretty much went further in terms of looking at this in three continents. So we've got here from the uh, Dominican Republic, we've got from Ghana and from Vietnam. And this figure here just shows the people who are, who are being pushed below the poverty line of less than a dollar a day at that point. So you can see that because of TB, people in the Dominican Republic are being pushed below the poverty line, the same in, same in Ghana. Um, and again, this kind of developed the tool uh, a, a bit further. They did mention in this that it's difficult to know sometimes in societies that are very... Um, influenced by, for example, markets or seasonal harvests, how you deal with that throughout the year. They also said that it's difficult to quantify, again, as I think some of the researchers are experiencing today, the um, indirect cost of lost income. Uh, there's a lot of recall bias related to that, um, and there's a few different ways of calculating that, which I'll talk to you about in a second. And then... As I said, we looked at a cohort of 900 patients in Peru, and um, we uh, really looked at different thresholds, so 10% of your annual income, 20, 30, 40, 50, and we tried to see which of those thresholds was associated with adverse treatment outcome. Uh, and in this case, we found that uh, costs of over 20% of your annual income uh, were associated with death, treatment failure, treatment abandonment, and it had an odds, it had an odds ratio of about two for having a treatment um, adverse outcome because of costs. So this had the advantage that for TB programs it was understandable in terms of um, the illness, but it also has a disadvantage of reducing uh, the burden that the household had has to an illness and not thinking a bit more holistically about what it means to the household in general, of, for example, being pushed further into poverty. And then this, this review by Tanimura et al. and the other, t the other members of the team at WHO was really it was a systematic review of all, all the published research about this. And uh, I could talk about this for, for, for a long time, but just to kind of cut a, a long story short, they found that about a third of the costs overall were due to lost income, and about half were incurred pre-treatment. So by the time people have even got to the diagnosis and even started their treatment, they've already had half of their costs. And so you'll see that pre-2015, really, there were lots of tools that were, had been developed over the years from 1990s and were being used in, in different places, but there was no standardized measurement. And so in 2015, with the NTB strategy, WHO said that we needed to eliminate catastrophic costs, but we also needed to provide socioeconomic support. And so since about 2014, with a task force we've been developing on the background of all that research that I showed you and the USAID cost tool, a, a, a survey uh, with which to measure patient costs that takes into account all of the things we've talked about. So out-of-pocket expenditure, uh, indirect costs, relocation costs, food costs, uh, and time costs, but also dissaving and coping costs. And this is just an example of when we might uh, use this questionnaire. For example, this is in the intensive phase. But you'll note that we ask the questions about the costs that people can recall here. And then we will estimate the continuation phase costs. And if we do this, we see a patient in, um, in their continuation phase. It might be that their recall is not good enough for pretreatment to give us accurate estimation, uh, accurate um, um, data uh, about their costs and actually we can use what we have from continuation phase but estimate what uh, they had during, during the intensive phase in terms of their costs. Now that's problematic in terms of the fact that you're using a lot of estimations um, but it's, it might be logistically the only thing that's possible, a single review. 
But it's hoped that within some subpopulations or subgroups, we might be able to do some longitudinal surveys, whether that's down to external funding from other research. Because, for example, the work I showed you in Peru, we visited the households every two weeks. And the indirect costs approach that we're using here, there, there's a couple. So you can use the output approach, where you say about lost income, what did you earn before, what do you earn now? Or the human capital approach, where you say, how much time have you lost? And then you multiply that by a wage. And those two can give very different results. And I think we're seeing that in some of the work that's coming through now. And so these are things that we need to iron out in the coming, uh, in the coming years. The survey will give us a chance to look at these different thresholds and, and do sensitivity analyses, say 10% of annual income, 20, 30, 40, uh, and that will be very useful. I'll mention that again in just a second. We could also look at whether dissaving, the selling of your assets or, or, or asset scores, for example, are useful as proxy measures of catastrophe because they're easy questions to ask as opposed to uh, longitudinal surveys of, of, of the minutiae of patient costs. And clearly the tool the survey is not going to work the same for each country and on the ground it will have to be piloted and there will be local adaptations to be made uh, in each of the country settings. In terms of future directions, it gives us the opportunity to do cross-country comparisons. We could link this with other data that we get, for example, TB treatment outcomes, and I think we're going, we might hear about that later today, but also uptake of social protection or even social protection spending, um, as we've seen from other papers, for example, from Aaron, Aaron Reeves in The Lancet about social protection and, and TB rates. There's also great potential for linking these with modelling studies. And for example, a recent paper that was published just about a week ago was looking at expansion of, a model of expansion of uh, TB services in uh, India and South Africa. Um, and really it found that we won't achieve the reduction of catastrophic costs that we want purely with expansion of services. We will need some additional social support for patients and their families. I think we can also think about beyond TB. Well, what would cost mitigation strategies mean for a household in terms of uh, a, a child's growth, in terms of a child's performance in school, in terms of work opportunities uh, uh, over the coming years for the household? Generationally, what might that mean for the household? So in conclusion, I think that the fact that we're measuring the economic burden of TB affected households is the most important thing. I think the threshold, I think you need a threshold for policy, but I think the most important thing is that you're here, that we're talking about it, and we're actually acknowledging it. The threshold, I think, probably has, has slightly less importance. The, the threshold also needs to be refined as we get further data. And we can adapt the surveys, as I said, at a country level. It's not that one size will fit all. Something may work better for one country than another. And I think it opens the door, once we have a better understanding of those costs, to look into trials of cost mitigation, social protection interventions, and also integrated socioeconomic support strategies, which are clearly going to be needed from the data that we already have stretching back 20 years and the data we're gathering uh, over the last year or two. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Winfield. Uh, I'd like to uh, just mention about the structure of the workshop. Uh, the, the Dr. Winfield just gave uh, us a very comprehensive historical development of this area of the work, cost, cost studies, and then patient uh, implication for the TB patients. And then following after this, we are going to have a three country experience from Vietnam and then Timor-Leste and uh, Ghana. Then uh, last presentation we are going to have is a WHO uh, presentation on the uh, progress, methodology and progress uh, so far uh, uh, in terms of the measuring catastrophic cost due to TB. So uh, then we are going to have after our presentation. Yeah, th uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nobu. And uh, good uh, afternoon, everyone, for the time uh, to stay here. And uh, uh, on behalf of Vietnam AGP, uh, I would like to pre present a summary of the results of the First National TB Patient Cost Survey in Vietnam and uh, my focus on the uh, policy uh, uh, making after this. 
So this is the uh, outline of my presentation. This is the, uh, I will present a, a very brief on the background, rationale, and objective of the study, uh, and a very summary of the main reasons, and the policy implication, uh, the intervention, and conclusion. So uh, for the study objective, uh, uh, we conduct the first national TB patient cost study in Vietnam in the year 2016 and uh, collect data in the field from the July to the October 2016 with the aim to identify the main cost driver to help guide cost mitigation policy and reduce the finance barrier to assess to care and treatment adherence. And uh, also is to establish a baseline me measurement for the percentage of the TB affected household ex exper experiencing sing, cat catastrophic cost due to TB in Vietnam. And we have planned to do the five year uh, repeated uh, the study. The survey background this is the, we have a total budget of the 64,000 US dollars through the challenge TB uh, via the WHO headquarters. And uh, with the sample size, we calculation, this is the 720 uh, sample size, and we uh, have included the 735 eligible, including 58 MDRTB cases and uh, 677 uh, TB, uh, TB cases. In 20 cluster, uh, in each cluster, we uh, recruit uh, 36 to 40 uh, TB patients. Uh, and uh, you can see in the map, this is uh, mm, the cluster is uh, in the in the north, uh, in the center of Vietnam, and also in the south of Vietnam. Uh, the in incentive per interview is uh, about three dollar, and uh, study time is uh, we conducted is uh, in one year, and uh, with the time of the data collection is uh, about three months. Uh, we apply the paper based data collection, and uh, after that we uh, enter data to the uh, on, the, uh, on A. So uh, uh, this slide show you the the main uh, uh, results of the study. So in Vietnam, 63% of households with TB uh, have uh, experienced it's a cost about 20% of the, their their annual household income. So uh, in here is a 60% of the uh, of the household. This is the mixed criteria of Cartacho cost in Vietnam. And this is very high in the MDRTB cases, it's a 98%. So uh, this slide shows you the cost uh, per uh, episode for uh, TB and MDRTB and for own. So uh, for the MDRTB, you can see that this is the, the most cost happen is for the travel accommodation foods nutritional supplement. Now, but for the uh, TB cases, the main cost is, is the household income loss. It's the, the total cost uh, in general is uh, about $1,320 per TB patient and uh, $4,289 for MDR-TB cases and $1,068 for drug sensitive TB. So uh, for the travel, it's uh, uh, the most, uh, the, the first uh, driver cost for the MDITB case is nearly 2,000. And uh, the second is uh, for household income loss after TB. For the TB cases, this is the first one is household income loss, and the second is this, uh, the travel accommodation boost. So uh, the, uh, our results have been uh, disseminated uh, in the uh, 11 NTP manager meeting in Tokyo in March 2017. And uh, Professor Jung uh, already uh, NTP manager present the results. And uh, also uh, present the detail of the results in the Union Conference in the year 2016. And uh, uh, in country, we have a, a result dissemination meeting with the partner, with the Moliza and the uh, WHO, uh, WHO uh, country office, uh, headquarter, and also uh, the uh, Ministry of Health. And uh, the survey, the result of this survey is also win, uh, have uh, in the box 7.1 in the Global TB Report 2017, 
which will be uh, published uh, soon. And uh, we are also prepared for manuscript for publication of the result of this, this study. So uh, for the policy dialogues and action planning based on survey finding in Vietnam, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we have organized a stakeholder meeting uh, who have to review the survey results and agree on priority action to address the catastrophic patient cost with the Ministry of uh, Labor, and, uh, Labor and Social Affairs, this is Moliza, and uh, uh, Department of Ministry of Health, Pharma Union, Women Union, uh, WHO. And uh, we have decided the roadmap with the priority action. It's, uh, uh, we will establish a charity fund for TB patients. It's, uh, uh, we, uh, it's, uh, we, uh, we hope that we, uh, we could uh, uh, Established this in the end of this year, and uh, the charity fund is the win support for TB patient for uh, procure for health insurance and uh, support for the co-funding by the health insurance cost. Uh, the second is strengthen the collaboration between the Ministry of Health and Moliza for support for the poor people and uh, costing a package of am ambulatory TB service for inclusion in National Health Insurance Scheme and advocating for donor support for TB specific patient support. So uh, before the survey, uh, we have a social protection is the, we have a health insurance uh, in Vietnam is in from the 1990 with the free uh, TB diagnostic, uh, diagnostic test and cover for the chest X-ray, free for sputum smear, and uh, first line TB drug uh, provide free of charge by NTP. And for the other drug, uh, it's covered by the social health insurance or paid uh, by the, our pocket payment. And uh, uh, ancillary drug for MDRTB cases is uh, covered by the global fund projects or by the social health insurance. However, uh, currently, we have uh, no mechanic to facilitate the application of income compensation or, uh, or social security. And the social protection in Vietnam does not target uh, to be affected. Uh, only we are uh, pilot in one province, in Khánh Hòa province. And uh, it's only in two districts in Khánh Hòa province. And TB patient in treatment uh, have not received uh, social assistance and uh, assess social work service. So after the survey, uh, as I mentioned, NTP have planned to launch the uh, patient uh, TB Foundation uh, in no, uh, November of 2017, charity fund for TB patients. And uh, NTP, uh, with the Ministry of Health and Moliza, developed a roadmap for collaboration. This is a, uh, with the five, five, point, five main points. The first one is scale up and adapt for TV patient, for uh, uh, Moliza to uh, procure health insurance costs for the poor and make the exist, uh, existing general social protection scheme TB sensitive and assess the additional finance and human resource need for the TV patient and also for MDR TB cases. And change the health, uh, health service staff on the social protection and social service staff on uh, relevant aspect of TB. And the last one is the zone uh, Moliza MOA on the monitoring and evaluation of the old activity and uh, colla collaboration. And the third one, uh, Ministry of Health and Moliza is uh, to assess the current regulation for the worker protection with the view to strengthen and optimally operationalize legal framework and develop a cost a comprehensive package of amb ambulatory TB service and advocate for cover by health insurance and uh, include TB specific social protection element in the global fund funding request for the 2018 2020. And uh, this funding request uh, with this component is also have uh, approved, primary approved by the global fund. The NTP Moliza uh, have to work uh, towards the national policy guide 
an intervention to reduce the TB patient cost. And uh, at TB, and we also have uh, one project, it's the Impact, Impact TB Partner, and WHO to use the Impact uh, TB Research Platform to test some new approach to improve patient support and reduce patient cost. As uh, we know from the studies, the patient cost is uh, mainly from traveling for the MDR-TB cases. So we, uh, we have uh, some of the intervention to reduce the patient cost by reduce the uh, travel cost. And NTP, WHO, and social protection action, research and knowledge sharing partner to adapt uh, the SPAC uh, monitoring and evaluation framework for the assessment of the new initiates which should be put under the umbrella of uh, victory in Vietnam. So uh, for the intervention, uh, we have uh, some of the kind of intervention uh, divided by the diagnosis, by treatment. Uh, it's uh, by the diagnosis, we have a sy systematic screening. It's also uh, before the study, but now we uh, more focused and more strengthened on this active case fighting in uh, HIV population, active case fighting in prison, contact investigation, and uh, active case fighting in district province with a high population uh, by the province use the local source from the local authority. Uh, private public mixed uh, pilots for the social center and uh, for the minor. So uh, for the social center, we have a pilot already in Khánh Hòa and we win uh, Khánh Hòa province and we win extension for this and conducting, uh, apply the, the research for the ACT2 and ACT3. ACT2 is uh, for the active case fighting for the household contact, and ACT3 is the active case fighting in the community. And uh, intervention on the patient cost for improving access to care, case detection. Uh, this is the, uh, for the improving for the access to care, we uh, win uh, try to for the intervention of the health seeking improvement for strengthen the ACRM, strengthen the role of the community care, uh, move diagnosis to the community to uh, expect that uh, we will reduce the transport cost, uh, increase use the rapid, uh, rapid diagnosis test uh, as the initial diagnosis for TB. So we will reduce the, uh, the time for the TB patient for diagnosis reduce or eliminate the patient fee uh, for the TB-related uh, diagnosis test and increase the uh, inter integration of, of the uh, practical approach to lung health, HIV, and child health. And for the treatment, this is uh, the intervention for treatment is uh, we have uh, in, uh, for the treatment administration. This is uh, for the DOT or cell administer treatment uh, selection of the dot provider and dot uh, uh, location. And we also have a pilot, uh, the uh, uh, video observer treatment, uh, VDOT, uh, in, in Hanoi. And uh, we conduct, the, have a, have a public this, the study and uh, conduct the second one in, in Thanh Hoa province. For social support, uh, we have to mapping a provider and support resources in country and its province. So uh, this is uh, also is, uh, one activity of the Zero TB City. Organize community-based patient support, patient education material support, psycholo uh, uh, psychological support, staff education. And for chase uh, digital health intervention is uh, to uh, make the patient is more adherent by home visit, phone call, by e-health and m-health. So the innovative policy in TB control, we will try to provide comprehensive treatment for all TB patients, diagnosis free for all TB and MDR-TB and TB cases. Uh, apply the precision medicine. Uh, we uh, we will uh, try to have an uh, expert at D, uh, DST before treatment and for uh, first, uh, first line regimen short uh, nine months for the MDR-TB case with the uh, only uh, uh, resistance for rifampicin and pre, uh, pre or HDR-TB baraculin based regimen. And that I mentioned is the uh, support, patient support foundation to win TB. Management for latent TB infection, in innovative planning supervision, and uh, effective application of the 
web-based information system and innovative of the ACRA. Uh, we organized the Miss TV contest and uh, Woodwind ambassador. In uh, conclusion, uh, TB uh, patients uh, often accuse the last court related to INIS and uh, on parade in Vietnam, uh, patients uh, in queue about the 1,068 US dollar for the TB cases and uh, 4,289 for MDR TB cases. And uh, especially the house, the household below the international poverty line is increased from the 3.7% before TB to 21.4% after TB. Uh, the proportion of TB affected household facing uh, uh, cost beyond uh, 20% in Vietnam is high, 63%. And NTP need to identify key area for policy action. Uh, given the importance of the post disease cost associated with the uh, nutritional uh, supplement, additional food, travel, and accommodation, a removal of such barrier would seem uh, pertinent to lower the finance uh, burden imposed, uh, imposed for on the TV patient. And this is the, uh, the we will focus on the established establishment of the patient support person to win TV. So uh, this slide so we will summarize the, the study. So uh, with the study, we have a 20 cluster across country with the total of the uh, 735 uh, uh, TB cases, including 677 TB patients and 58 MDR TB cases. 63% of the TB cases is, uh, have a catastrophic cost, and 98% of the MDR TB cases have a catastrophic cost. And this is the amount of the uh, US dollar for the TB cases and for the MDR TB cases. And for the MDRTBK, the, the most driving this is the travel accommodation food. And uh, for the TBK, the most driving is the household income loss. And uh, household affected by TB is the 38% of the household employed. One of the strategy is taking a loan, uh, use of saving, or borrowing, or sale of the assets. 22% of the household experience of food security, and 27% of the household per perceive uh, the finance burden as a serious or very serious due to the TB. And the proportion is much higher in the MDR TB. This is my uh, acknowledgement for the WHO headquarters, WHO Vietnam, uh, NTB, and staff from 20 Dixit TB units in six province uh, in, uh, for conducting this study. And thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thanks Andrew, and hello everyone. Let's wait for the slides. Maybe I need to. Just wait for the slides. <laughs> well, I should just. Uh, Okay, that's not the first one, maybe, where are we? I can go back now, good. Okay, okay, well, yeah, thanks everyone, and thank you for the introduction. I should just say that we're not quite as advanced as Vietnam, um, because we've literally just finished our analyses, so we haven't had our policy dissemination discussion, um, so I'm really just presenting the results, and you'll see that I won't be presenting many of the policy implications, but that's certainly is something that we're going to be discussing in the next few months. I should also say that I'm just presenting this presentation on behalf of a colleague, Susanna Vazniri, who wasn't able to be here. Uh, the only conflict of interest I have is that we got funded to do this study, so, <laughs> so that was good news, but we had a very small amount of funding, so we had 15,000 Australian dollars, which is about 12,000 US dollars, so we did this on a very tight budget. So just a little bit of the country context of Timor-Leste. Um, it is the eastern half of the island of Timor and one nearby small island and a very small exclave, which is this little bit here. Um, on the Northwest Island, um, surrounded by West Timor, which is actually Indonesia. 
has a population of about 1.2 million people, so it has a small population, but it does have a lot of TB. So it has about 3,500 TB cases every year, and they're the notifications, and has an estimated TB incidence rate of just under 500 per 100,000, so it has quite a high TB incidence rate. It has about 120 uh, drug-resistant cases a year, and less than 1% TB HIV co-infection. Now, Timor-Leste is a lower middle income economy and it has a medium human development and ranks 133 out of 188 countries on the Human Development Index. And many people might know, but um, Timor-Leste only became independent in 1999. They were admitted to the UN as a member state in 2002. So a very young country in terms of its independence. And it had many years of protracted and violent conflict between uh, Indonesian military and the separatist groups in Timor-Leste. So during that time, many of the services were completely disrupted, including the health services. So just to show you where Timor-Leste is, you can see there it is with the um, red circle there, so sort of sandwiched between Papua New Guinea, Indonesia and Australia. So in terms of the patient cost survey, we had five objectives. And the first one was to determine the direct and indirect cost due to TB diagnosis and care. And we were interested in the period between symptom onset to treatment completion. So we were asking questions right back to when symptoms first appeared. As for all of the surveys, we wanted to estimate the proportion of households who experienced catastrophic costs due to TB. We also wanted to undertake a policy analysis of the existing social and financial protection policies in Timor-Leste, and they have had a history of having social protection initiatives in that country, predominantly funded by the World Bank. Uh, our fourth objective was to provide some recommendations on policies and interventions to minimise the barriers for accessing care and staying in that care and to mitigate the economic impact of TB for patients and their households. And lastly, we wanted to plan some future research to further examine the determinants of cost barriers among patients and to assess the effectiveness of these interventions. And we're not at objective five yet because we've just finished the analysis. So in terms of our methodology, very similar to other surveys that have been conducted, so it was a cross-sectional health facility-based survey. The, the difference in Timor-Leste was that we didn't use random sampling of the health facilities, we sampled all of the health facilities, all of the dot centres, I should say, not every health facility, but all of the designated dot centres. So we sampled from 17 health facilities, so one in every municipality except that little exclave that I showed you on the map, which is called Akusi. And we had six health facilities in Dili, which is the capital, and 11 outside of Dili. Now our sample size was 445 TB patients, and we had quotas for each health facility, and we had to sample people who had been on TB treatment for at least two weeks, which is what's written up in the generic protocol. So we recruited 25 patients from each health facility, except in Dili, where we recruited 25 from five health facilities, and from the sixth health facility we recruited 50 patients, because that health facility sees a large number of patients. Now, because we were doing this on a fairly tight budget, we used the TB district coordinators, or the nurses, as our interviewers. And ideally, we wouldn't have done that, but because we were so constrained in our budget, we had to use existing staff, and they got an additional um, sort of subsidy to do those interviews. People were interviewed at the health facilities, they were interviewed in their local language, and we collected data electronically uh, and used the ONA platform to collect the data and to manage the data. So this is just a map showing uh, Timor-Leste and our 17 health facilities. So you can just see them spread out across the map there. And we had six health facilities uh, in Dili, the capital. So what did we find? So these are just some of the demographic and social characteristics of our, our um, sampled population. So we had about half male and females and our median age was 32, and we had a small number of children, so 5% children. 
As you can see in terms of some of the educational um, data there, we had about one third of the population who have never attended school, and then about one third who have attended secondary school, so a wide range of people. Uh, and we had about 44%, 45% who were employed, but also about a third of patients were unemployed. In terms of our wealth quintiles, people were spread out across the wealth quintiles there. So you can see that it's approximately 20% in each wealth quintile. So just some of the clinical and care characteristics of this group, and I should say we recruited just over our sample size, so we recruited 457 patients, so just over the 445. So you can see that the majority of people had pulmonary TB, so almost 90% there. Um, we had no drug-resistant TB and only one person who reported that they were HIV positive. And most of the cases consistent with the epidemiology of TB in Timor-Leste were new cases. And we also measured treatment delay and only 5% of people reported a treatment delay of greater than four weeks. So what did we find in terms of the financial burden? So we looked at the household income and the individual income, pre-TB and post-TB, and looked at the difference. So this table is just presenting that data. So you can see that for the household income, so this is in US dollars per year, the, um, the mean household income was about 2,700 US dollars per year. So this is quite a poor population. Uh, and post-TB, that reduced to about $2,100 per year. So we've got about a 23% reduction at the household level in the household income. Now, we also asked if the patient was the main income earner in that household, and you can see that 26.3% of patients were the main income earner in that household. We also looked at individual income. And you can see there for the individual, they earn about half the household income, so about 1,300 US dollars annually. And post-TB, that's reduced to about 900 US dollars annually. So that's a 30% reduction in the individual income for those patients. So that obviously for our objective two, we were interested in the proportion of TB patients who actually have catastrophic costs. And as Tom explained, we use a couple of approaches to look at that. Um, and you can see here that 83% of patients had catastrophic costs, so that's 20% or more of the household income, household annual income. And when we looked at it using the human capital approach, it was 82%, so not much different. So this is quite a poor population who are experiencing most of the patients, four, four out of five patients, are spending 20% or more of their household annual income on TB. So we also looked at where are these costs incurred, and this is quite a busy pie chart. I hope you can see those numbers. But you can see that the different colours represent the medical costs before and after diagnosis, the non-medical costs before diagnosis, income loss in purple, and then a range of costs after diagnosis. So um, in this particular um, group of people, the medical costs before diagnosis were negligible, um, and the non-medical costs before diagnosis were also negligible. But the main costs really became um, the medical costs after diagnosis, so you can see 7% of the total costs were medical costs after diagnosis, and then the orange there, which is travel, so 13% of the costs were associated with travel. But these big, the big, biggest proportions of cost, as you can see, are in the purple and the magenta colours. So 41% of the total costs were due to income loss, and 38% of costs were due to nutritional um, aspects, so an after diagnosis. And we're not quite sure why these nutritional costs are so high. We've seen this in other surveys. Uh, we also looked at this by wealth quintiles, so we did the same pie chart but looked at it by the five different wealth quintiles, and as you become poorer, those nutritional costs get higher as a proportion of the total costs. So we're not really sure why this is, but certainly some aspect of food insecurity is associated with TB here in this particular context. So um, Tom explained the coping mechanisms and social effects, which are also measured in a TB patient cost survey. 
And as you can see here, in terms of dissaving or using your savings to finance your TB care, about 5% of patients use their savings, 11% borrowed money, and 17% had to sell some kind of asset. When we looked at the social effects, this food insecurity issue comes up again. So 15% described that they experienced some kind of food insecurity. Uh, about the same proportion, 14.5% lost their job. And we're not sure, maybe the loss of the job contributes to the food insecurity. We're not sure. We might do some further analysis to look at that. Uh, and 3.5% uh, had some sort of interruption in schooling. So we also asked patients about whether they access some kind of social support after their TB diagnosis, and you can see there that less than 1% accessed any kind of social support after the TB diagnosis. So just to summarise the main findings, oh, there we go. Um, so as I said, 83%, oh, sorry, 83 or almost all patients experience catastrophic costs. And this is higher than in Vietnam, higher than in Myanmar, and higher than in some other countries. And I think we need to understand why. I think one reason is that this is a fairly impoverished population, and they may be poorer to start with, or there may be a greater proportion of people who are already below the poverty line. And we're going to do some further analyses to look at that. So um, income was reduced by about 30%. And as I just mentioned, we're going to do some further analyses to look at whether these people were already in poverty, were they pushed below the poverty line by the diagnosis of TB, and we're going to do some um, further work on that in the next couple of weeks. Selling assets was the most common coping strategy, and we wonder if this adds further weight to the fact that the poor may be more severely affected by TB. And income loss, as I showed you in that pie chart, income loss and nutrition cost post-diagnosis make up the majority. So that made up about 80% of the costs. And we're trying to work out this nutritional aspect. Are we asking the right questions? Is this really a true finding? And if it is true, what, what's driving this? Are patients being asked to buy special foods or to buy meat? Or we we're not quite sure. So we need to unpack that a little bit. Oh, sorry. Um, and food insecurity was the most common social effect, and we're not sure that might be related to being unemployed, might be related to job loss. And as I mentioned at the start of this presentation, uh, we need to discuss and define the policy implications, and we haven't had a dissemination meeting yet in Timor-Leste, but I'm hoping that will come soon. Um, and we'll be writing up a policy brief to share with the, with the policy makers so that we can have some dialogue around the meaning of these findings in Timor-Leste. So I'd just like to um, acknowledge the collaborators on this slide, including uh, Andrew and Ines, who are in this room. So thank you. We completed data collection and started the analysis of the data. And for this symposium, I was asked to uh, particularly focus on treatment outcomes and nutritional status measures in terms of BMI or body mass index. So I'm going to talk a little bit, uh, I'll give a very brief uh, overview, a review of the evidence of the effects of costs on, on treatment outcomes. And then I'll give a bit of context about this, uh, the cost survey in Ghana, um, the implementation and the methodology that we adopted um, and uh, give an overview of the pre of preliminary findings from the survey. In particular, I'll focus on the level and composition of costs the provo and the proportion of household facing catastrophic costs and some preliminary data about treatment outcomes and uh, BMI. And um, I will conclude by um, raising a couple of points to hopefully stimulate some discussion um, around conceptual, methodological, and analytical issues um, when we try to assess the um, possible relationship between uh, catastrophic costs and treatment outcomes. So I said it would be a very brief overview um, and review of the effects of costs on TB treatment outcomes because the evidence is very limited. Um, I found a couple of studies. One is a systematic review that was conducted in China by Long et al. in 2011 that showed the loss of income and higher costs are associated with poorer treatment adherence and higher default rates. And the second study, the study by Tom and his colleagues conducted in Peru, which found a higher cost at a threshold of 20% of, of household annual income are independently associated with unsuccessful TB treatment outcome, especially amongst MBR-TB patients. So, 
uh, the clinical importance of TB-related cost remains unclear. In terms of the context of the survey, so Ghana um, is a lower middle income country. It has experienced like positive economic growth for about two decades. However, um, about a quarter of, its, of the Ghanaian population still live below the poverty line and inequalities are still striking in the country, especially in certain parts in north and northwestern areas of uh, Ghana. Uh, as to the TB situation, in 2013 a prevalence survey showed that the burden of disease is actually three times higher than we previously thought. And the survey also highlighted that there are like high barriers to accessing and adhering to TB care. Um, TB care in Ghana is provided free of charge uh, to TB patients uh, with the exception of chest radiography, which costs about $8 per, um, per chest x-ray done. Um, also, like across for the last few years, the prevalence of adverse TB outcomes have been uh, particularly high. So we adapted the WHO um, survey instrument. Um, the schematic on the right-hand side of the slide shows the main components of the survey tool. And we added a collection of anthropometric measures in terms of um, so the assessment of BMI. Uh, we also like included a collection of consumption expenditure and expenditure data in addition to income, and this is because, uh, in especially in lower in low income settings that are characterized by a, um, a bigger share of the employment outside the formal sector, expenditure is considered like a more reliable um, uh, measure of living standard than income. And we also like collected treatment outcomes. This is an add-on. That um, the task force on patient cost survey on patient cost is recommended as an adult study to patient cost survey. So we decided to collect um, treatment outcomes. So we we undertook data collection in November and December 2016, so last year, and we the total the eligible sample size for the survey was 691 patients. Sensitive patients incurred uh, about $850 per TB episode, while MDR-TB patients experienced double this, uh, the, the double this cost. Um, the, the largest share of this, this cost was represented by income loss, followed by expenditure on food, similarly to the to other survey, that was very high, and then uh, followed by medical cost. And we'll have to look a bit more into like food cost again. This includes supplements, uh, food supplements, as well as uh, actual purchase of food. At a threshold of 20% of household annual, annual income, 64% of patients and their household are deemed as facing catastrophic cost in Ghana. And when we looked at consumption expenditure as opposed to income, so the first row which is, forms the basis of the output approach, the situation is not very different because we have still about 62% of households facing catastrophic costs. And when we look at just medical and non-medical costs, so only direct costs, excluding like income losses, about half uh, of the patients still experience catastrophic costs, and when we look at only medical costs, it's about, this proportion is about 15%. So moving on to treatment outcome, um, we collect the treatment outcome uh, through follow-up conversations with, with staff at health facilities uh, in June and July um, so this year, so a few uh, couple of months ago, really. And the treatment and clinical staff was asked to check the treatment outcomes as it was recorded on TB patient cards and on TB register. So the survey team didn't assess the outcome themselves, but it was the clinical staff doing that. Treatment outcomes were classified as favorable if the patients who completed their treatment were, uh, were declared complete their treatment were declared cured, or adverse if patients did not complete treatment because they either died, were rushed to follow up, or um, or uh, had a treatment failure. And we adopt this operational definition for the purposes of this analysis. So we had um, about uh, we had 97 percent of our patient in our of patients in our sample had a defined outcome at the time of follow up. So in June July, 2017, and we excluded 16 patients who were still on treatment at the time of follow up, and amongst the patients who had an available outcome, 
over 90% um, of patients had a successful outcome, so had a completed overall disclosure cured. The proportion of patients with an adverse outcome um, was about 9%. In terms of the level of cost, so this is mean total cost experienced by patients by outcome categories, patients who, were, who died or lost the follow-up experienced a higher level of cost per TB episode, although we need to remember that the number of patients in these categories is low. So we looked at various uh, characteristics of the study sample um, and we found no evidence of a difference in, for example, uh, by MDR or HIV status, or whether uh, the patients experience delays in seeking care, or, whether, or based on the place of residence. And we didn't find any evidence of an association between treatment outcomes and catastrophic cost. Now I'm going to present now some data about uh, BMI. Uh, BMI was assessed in two ways. So we they used the weight recorded on the TB treatment cards at the start of treatment. And then we trained the um, field officers, the interviewers, to record height and weight that were met, uh, at the time of interview, although not without um, some challenges. So uh, this, this, in this slide I'm going to show like this is the distribution of BMI in the study sample. So the graph on the right-hand side shows the distribution of BMI at the time of interview, so the one that we collected during the survey and we measured during the survey. And you can see that the median BMI is slightly higher than the, time, the, 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 the median of the BMI that was recorded from the treatment cards. And obviously also the, percent, the, percent, the proportion of patients who are classified as being underweight decreased at the time of interview. And when we looked at a possible association between uh, nutritional status uh, and catastrophic cost and treatment outcome, we couldn't find any evidence of an association. So I'd like to conclude by um, raising a couple of points here and hopefully stimulate some discussion for uh, the end of this session. So why are we not seeing an association uh, between cost and treatment outcomes in Ghana? Well, probably because patient cost surveys are not designed to look at this. It's a recommended add-on, but um, the sample size is not adequate to detect an association. And hopefully the picture might be a bit different when we are going to undertake like multi-country analysis in the near future. Also, like the fact that there's not an association doesn't mean that costs are obviously okay. Um, TB-related costs remain unacceptably high even in contexts where TB care is supposed to be free of charge. So we, we know that TB bears wider and longer term consequences for the individual and their household that go beyond TB, the end of TB treatment. So probably like treatment success is not a good enough measure to um, assess quality of life of patients after the end of treatment. And ideally, we, might, we would be looking at um, TB sequela using longitudinal study designs. And there's a study, the TB sequel study in South Africa, which is going to look at longer term um, medical and socioeconomic uh, consequences of the disease. And all our findings really, again, um, strengthen what other countries have shown. So we are, they, and they all point to the role of social protection, and then the formal health insurance, social transfers in terms of vouchers, for transfer, transport vouchers, for example, or nutritional support to patients, or labor protection policies. And they emphasize that social protection is crucial, really mitigating uh, financial risk and alleviating the, con the consequences of um, TB disease. Thanks. I would like to thank my, our collaborators in, at the National TB Control, Control Program in Ghana, um, Andrew, who's in the room, and the other, the other members of the team. Thank you. Thank you globally and plans for the future. Buenas tardes a todas y a todos. It is a pleasure to be presenting um, the status of um, implementation on, of patient cost surveys globally. 
Um, this presentation is on behalf of the three of us who are um, providing support and guidance to uh, various countries on the implementation of this methodology that was established in 2015 and fine-tuned fine -tuned in 2017. Um, uh, oops. Sorry. Just on the conflict of interest disclosure, we got some funding for the uh, handbook development for the methodology that will be published at the end of the year from Challenge TB. So the uh, agenda for the next 15 minutes is going to look at uh, what, in, what it involves implementing the TB patient cost service, although you've just uh, seen how um, the adaptation of the methodology has worked in three countries. Um, our role as the World Health Organization, um, global progress and implementation status for um, high burden and not high burden countries, and what country and global monitoring um, is, will be in, in practical terms, and um, what this uh, survey and the evidence stemming from it opens as an opportunity to um, further collaborate with existing social protection platforms. So in terms of what it involves implementing the TB survey, first of all, um, our recommendation is that a baseline survey is established by 2020. And this in order to, um, to establish um, the, the baseline indicator for um, one of the three high NTB uh, um, indicators of zero catastrophic cost by 2020. And we recommend the, a repeat survey to look at the progress with respect to the baseline every five years, for instance. And we hope that the survey will inform, um, for example, uh, transition reforms on TB patient care and, um, and the withdrawal of donors, etc. So this, there are five steps mainly for the implementation of the survey. First of all is to have an initial discussion and fundraising. So our recommendation is that this activity um, is part of the rest of the monitoring and evaluation activities. Hence, the fund raising is done in a similar way as to the other m &E activities. So for the surveys that have been carrying, carried out, the funding has been either domestic for India, for example, for, from CDC for Uganda, uh, from uh, Challenge TB for Vietnam, from academia, uh, such as Timor-Leste or Ghana and so on. And CDC, did I mention CDC? Okay. Um, the second is to look at the situation assessment. So beyond the regular situation assessment that we do for national strategic planning, which looks at TB, um, epidemiology, the financing, we also need to look at national health insur insur insurance schemes, how healthcare, fee stru stru structures are um, established, the healthcare delivery model, the social protection platforms that exist, um, and the access for TB patients to um, whatever platforms are established, and also to look at uh, previous uh, patient cost um, studies that may have been carried out perhaps with a different methodology prior to 2015. The third is the protocol development. So we have issued a generic protocol and an instrument that is ready for countries to adapt. And um, so the principal investigator, of course, is leading on this process and, um, and carries out until ethics review and so on. Training um, may take a day or perhaps a couple or three, depending on, on the country, and we are looking at uh, no more than three trainers uh, per country in order to standardize the data collection, and the survey coordinator should lead the training with the principal investigator, and if there is need for um, uh, technical assistance to be present, that can be also um, uh, a, a, a participatory approach, but in theory, the survey coordinator should be leading this uh, process. Data collection has taken between two months 
and sometimes longer, but for um, reasons that are more to do with the management of an operational research project than f for the timing that this takes. And um, there's uh, countries that have opted with the paper uh, data collection, and most of the countries are going for an electronic data collection. Um, we have um, at the disposal of countries um, a data dictionary for uh, um, a platform called ONA that you have heard mentioned a couple times earlier on. And basically this can be adapted when the decisions on the content of the instrument have been done so that the, the, the data can be collected offline and then uploaded um, on a regular basis by the research assistant. And the advantage of this is that the survey coordinator can keep a close eye on the data as it comes in and feed back to the research assistant uh, in case there is a, a lack of quality on the data that is collected. And uh, similar platforms exist um, with similar data dictionaries, but the, the adaptation is very straightforward. And um, the analysis, um, so there, both for the cleaning and for the analysis, we have also developed a code in R and Stata that can be uh, put at the disposal of the countries that are implementing, which will be adapted based on the variables that and, and the adaptations that uh, the country does uh, for um, additional questions. And, um, and it takes around, well, it depends on the intensity of time that the, the person doing the analysis, but basically a first draft can be done pretty quickly when the, the programs are um, finalized. And, and then more fine tuning and then going back and forth to the research assistants if it's done on cleaning. And then dissemination policy and dialogue and action planning is the, um, the most interesting part, I find, because that's when the use of the evidence can, inf can be informing a, a, a plan that goes beyond health and s searches for multi-sectoral approaches to um, combat some of the barriers that prevent access to treatment and care and that have been highlighted in the, during the survey. And then finally, the publishing of the, of the report. Just to touch on one of the aspects um, that I mentioned, the, the identification of funding and initial discussion, I'm just putting out what the funding, roughly speaking, was for the, for the different surveys that have started. And uh, one, apart from the sample size and the um, scatterness of the clusters in the country which can drive the cost of the survey, is also the use of either in-house or outsourced uh, research assistance. So we do recommend that the survey is not carried out by healthcare workers in order to avoid bias in the answers collected, especially on out of pocket, direct out of pocket expenses. But um, if you see the lowest uh, cost uh, surveys um, were also associated with the use of existing staff. And just, uh, so just to carry on on the role of WHO, so we have five main um, areas of support. One is on guidance, so we are providing um, guidance on the survey design um, capacity, so we are developing um, in the, throughout the, the different uh, steps that I described earlier. Um, capacity, so uh, we have um, a consultant training that will happen next year, hopefully. And, um, <laughs> and uh, we maintain a roster of consultants based mainly from the task force that has been supporting the development of uh, WHO methodology from 2015 to 2017. Um, the support um, is in terms of uh, providing um, the coordinated technical support for all aspects of surveys from design to implementation and policy translation and dissemination. And so the policy and dissemination is more on the area that um, NOBU um, is um, uh, leading actually. So I invite those that are on, at the stage of policy dissemination to 
uh, reach out for Nobu and for Diana Whale. And um, monitoring, so uh, conducting cross-country um, analysis um, and global and regional synthesis of results. This, was be, this hopefully will be um, coming out once we have a pool of um, anonymized data that we can work on and maybe some of the um, topics that cannot be analyzed at the country level, like the association of costs and outcomes, maybe at the cross-country level, we might be able to um, dig out and, and with a larger pool of patients see more of a, um, a meaningful association. And um, we also track uh, one indicator um, in the, at the global level, so the proportion of households experiencing cost above 20% of household income. This indicator appears, uh, so it's reported by countries to the WHO, so it appears on the country profile. And finally, on the translation, so supporting the translation of survey findings into a range of policy options and basically making the business case to uh, include uh, TB patients into social protection schemes and to uh, design uh, policies that will lower um, direct cost, um, medical or non-medical, etc. And um, pursuing the path towards universal health coverage and enhancing social protection. So um, in terms of the global progress, this map was, will appear on the global TB report, but actually since August there's been some movement. So um, there are seven countries that are more or less at the final stage. So it's uh, Myanmar, Vietnam, Philippines, Kenya, Ghana, Timor-Leste, and Moldova. 11 countries are ongoing, so they are at the data collection stage, and this is China, Nigeria, India, Brazil, Zimbabwe, Bolivia, Mongolia, Fiji, Solomon Islands, Papua New Guinea, and Uganda. And in 2018, 2000, sorry, 2018, uh, there are 11 countries, amongst which uh, Liberia, South Africa, Mozambique, I hear Dominican Republic and Colombia uh, also, Swaziland, Romania, but Romania and Belarus are out of funding, so they, they won't be able to do it until they raise funding for this. And actually, Portugal and the UK are also going to um, do the survey, and Haiti also. And just to put the, the, this um, work into context, um, before 2015, we were using various tools and methods, like Tom was pointing out uh, earlier on, and now we are promoting the use of a standard uh, methodology and reporting formats. And um, in terms of sample size, we are talking about different sample sizes. So um, now we have, with 10 countries, around 10,000 patients. And before, um, we only had a substantial number of uh, patients from a few countries. And actually, from the, the surveys that were carried out um, before 2015, the focus was not so much on having a nationally representative figure. And also, costs were not necessarily um, measured against household income, only uh, around mm, 11. How many were there? 11 countries, um, which included India, Peru, South Africa, Ghana, Vietnam, Dominican Republic, China, Peru, Bangladesh, Thailand, and Brazil had costs that were compared with household income. The rest were not doing uh, necessarily that. They might have been doing compared to individual income or not even comparing, just um, measuring the, the size. And... Just um, in, to look at the implementation status, so this is um, a chart showing where we are at, but I al already explained earlier on, and this is for high burden countries. So we have 11 high burden countries that are at different stages of implementation. And then we have um, non high burden countries that are at various stages. So we have uh, Ghana and Moldova that are at um, uh, the phase of uh, disseminating results and manuscript writing. In terms of 
country and global monitoring. So as I was mentioning before, so on the left of the slide, you have the, the products that are available. So one is the handbook that will be published at the end of this year that has, um, amongst other things, the protocol and then the, the fine-tuned methodology that was developed with a, a TB patient cost task force. Um, the, um, that's the STATA code, but there's also an R code that is available for adaptation. And then that's an example of the electronic data collection tool for Bolivia, well, actually for Cochabamba. And on the left, let, no, right, you're right. Um, there is the global uh, TB report uh, country profile, and you see uh, circled the, the one indicator um, on the TB, TB patients facing catastrophic total cost in 2016. So this is Vietnam with 63% that Dr. Hua presented earlier. And in terms of uh, country monitoring, what we are recommending is that a minimum set of reporting standards are shown. So uh, the ones listed here, which include socioeconomic characteristics, model of care, hours lost um, seeking care, um, episode cost, uh, stratified if uh, the sample allows by TB and MDR status, and counts of household facing costs above uh, various thresholds and the odds of experiencing TB cost above 20% uh, of household income, which is the threshold that we are using for now. So in terms of the, um, the episode cost, which is one of the outputs that um, the survey is providing here, I'm showing um, the cost for the three surveys that have um, almost uh, finished the analysis and uh, and dissemination of results, and they are shown against the household income. And all, all I wanted to mention is that we now have a, an assessment of the costs that are borne by patients and the households, but that there's also uh, another side of the coin, which is what are the costs that are borne by the service provider. And for that, we have either secondary data that um, countries provide to WHO and that we feature in the global TB report. So this is um, on the on that side you have the patient cost and here you have a mixture of expenditure data plus an estimation of hospitalization and ambulatory care costs divided by the clients, the patients that year. And this is using secondary data, but ideally we should be looking, so this is the, um, the graph that is published on the Global TB Report where the, the cost per MDR treatment and the cost per DS tre treatment are shown on, uh, against the GDP per capita. So on the chapter six of the upcoming Global TB Report, you'll find this analysis again. But the, ideally, the cost should be looked, um, the economic cost should, from the provider perspective, it should, should be done uh, from primary data collection at the facility level. And this, for example, in Vietnam has been done by MIN uh, this year and uh, in, 20, in 2008, but there's no data for Myanmar and Ghana available. So in case that would be a point of interest, there are also tools and methodologies that are available through the Global Health Cost Consortium. Um, and um, we also hope that um, up upcoming data on provider cost and on patient cost will be in the unit cost data repository um, of the Global Health Cost Consortium. And the web page is on the screen. So just to finish, um, this is giving us an opportunity to reach out for social protection platforms. And this starts with a mapping before the survey even starts. So um, ministries and agencies whose mandates cover any of these schemes should be identified as key stakeholders and engaged prior to the survey and at the time of, uh, of dissemination of results. And you will be doing um, uh, an analysis of what are the TB-specific social protection schemes, such as cash transfers for TB patients, food and travel, housing and other support, vocational training, or looking at general social protection schemes, 
such as social assistance, which um, is not contributory, or social insurance, which is, and labor market interventions, and then right-based country legislation, which is listed here. And just um, on my last slide, I just want to point that uh, monitoring costs borne by patients is a joint effort where the national TB programs are leading and WHO and Patient Cost Survey Task Force can guide and provide technical assistance and WHO can monitor at the global level. And last but not least, uh, a long list of thank yous for uh, everyone who has contributed to the advance of the methodology um, for patient cost surveys. Thank you, Ines. So, uh, unfortunately, we don't have much time left, but uh, of course, we want to have a, a discussion here uh, for only for some minutes. So, uh, anybody want to comment? I know from my interactions with health workers that some, some say if the patient doesn't have special food, the treatment is in vain. So, I'm wondering whether there are a lot of wrong ideas about it and what is the evidence that the food doesn't matter at all, because I'm personally not sure. I think it doesn't matter, but I'm not sure. And maybe that should be something where action is needed. So maybe we don't have much time for the, you know, going back and forth. So maybe we can collect maybe two more questions. Thank you. My name is Massini from Kenya. We are at uh, the report writing stage. And thanks, Ines, and the team for the support. Um, and of course the presentations have been very informative and will be helpful. But we look forward to what happens after the survey, how this plugs into the, into the policy, and that's a potentially difficult area. We understand there's already generic guidance and we look forward to that. But we'll also look forward to the countries that have been forerunners. Could we have some, imp how they have done it and some reports so that we can be able to not repeat the same mistakes so that we don't get the same results five years down the line when we repeat. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, maybe one more. Yes. Dr. Square. I don't want to take it away from anywhere. Well, well it was only just a comment on, the, on this food question um, that, that seems to have come up now, not only in the national surveys, but in the Philippine survey in Cavite province, also in the stream trial. Um, it seems to be very prevalent, and I've been reflecting a little bit on it. Certainly, patients report feeling very hungry when they start TB patients, steep TB drugs. The patients sometimes feel that they need to, to eat when they, uh, you know, after they've taken their drugs, although we ask them to take their drugs on an empty stomach. So I'm guessing that this is a multifactorial thing uh, going on, but it, it is interesting that it's coming up everywhere we look. Okay, thank you very much. So maybe we can come back to the speakers for uh, addressing some of those questions. Who want to start? Yeah. Tom? Uh, yeah, th uh, I'd just like to talk about food <laughs> again. So um, just from, from experience in Peru, sometimes people were buying nutritional supplements that had no evidence whatsoever and were really expensive. For example, these, uh, I don't know, Vitabiotic type things. Um, and also some people were being told to have high protein diets, which I can understand. But um, I think people are spending their money on, on additional food. We don't know what, what the evidence is behind that, but we also don't know about food baskets. So food baskets are quite a common thing. We don't know what we should be providing, and I don't think there's good evidence for if that has any influence on people's outcomes, be they health or, or, uh, or, or otherwise. Um, so I, I do think that's something we need to look into a bit further, uh, a food supplementation that perhaps we could provide as, as health services. Thank you. Any other speakers? Katie? Uh, yeah, thanks, Tom. Um, in Timor Leste, we were wondering if people are being told to buy red meat or some kind of meat that is quite expensive that they might not normally eat. Um, so that was just a hypothesis. So we're wondering if uh, we can do, you know, we can find that out, I guess. But that's what we think it is in Timor Leste and or um, vitamin supplements uh, that they're being told to buy that are you know, probably quite expensive in that context. Okay, uh, is it okay for other speakers want to say something? Ah, sorry. 
Ah, okay. Yes. So maybe we have to close now, but uh, I really uh, learned a lot today, and then also probably this is shared by the many of many of uh, uh, people coming here today kindly. Uh, I think you know, as an acknowledgement of the Ines that you know, this work has been having a lot of input from the uh, many people and uh, who have been working in this area so many years. Uh, we really uh, cannot thank enough for all those who contribute in this work. And that this is a really critical work implementing NTV strategy. And then now we see the very complete case scenario already from Vietnam. We are happy to have this Vietnam case study to from the start uh, the survey to the uh, dialogue policy, uh, dialogue to the action planning. So I think hopefully probably next year by this time we can have more countries to have uh, this complete set of the activity done to really uh, discuss about the more intervention aspect as well, to how to reduce and minimize the uh, uh, suffering of the patient and then eliminate the patient catastrophic cost due to TB. So this, in this sense, I think uh, tomorrow we are going to have another symposium talking about the intervention to address the uh, patient catastrophic cost uh, organized by the and MSF. So that's also probably we can discuss, continue to discuss about this. Uh, so thank you very much for all your interest and the participation. And then this has been a very wonderful session. Thank you very much for all contributors. Thank you.